Well, this is exciting. This is our first ever online chat that we're going to put out to the world. So I'm really excited. And my name is Tony Kopechny. I'm one of the co-founders of Parsons TKO. Uh, and we have been having for four or five years now, fantastic internal conversations, uh, just like this over Zoom. And then we realized we should probably start recording these uh, and getting them out there for the rest of the world to, to get a look at what we talk about sometimes. You know, this is an informal setup, uh, but informed discussions. So that's really what we're shooting for here. You can let us riff and then, you know, hopefully if you like these, uh, you'll share it around and maybe we can start getting some other participants in here with us too. But I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves as well. I'll start with Stefan, who's in my upper left corner. Hello, I'm Stefan Bird Kruger. I'm the Chief Analytics Officer for Parsons TKO. Uh, leading the data strategy team, we spend a lot of time working with our clients, thinking through the types of problems that they face and the ways in which they can use data to address those. I think our team has a, has a lot of uh, sort of unique conversations around the unique circumstances that our teams encounter. And uh, we end up finding a lot of novel problems uh, and, uh, and novel solutions to those problems. So I think having a, a format where we can talk more about that is, uh, is really exciting. And uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Nate Parsons, uh, the other co-founder of Parsons TKO. And, uh, you know, I, I echo my colleagues' thoughts that, uh, you know, we've had a lot of really interesting and thought-provoking discussions that have, um, you know, started often with our own problems or hearing about things that our clients are interested in and, you know, taking those to really interesting places. But a lot of that knowledge has been ended up, ended up locked inside an organization and we haven't had the chance to bring others into the conversation. And so I'm also really thrilled to be a part of this and to sort of open up, you know, some of our, our musings to the wider community. So for our first show, uh... Stefan had just come back from being at the Data X conference in San Francisco, where he moderated um, two days worth of panel discussions about machine learning. So I thought that might be an interesting place to start. You know, what were the experiences of the conference? And Nate also attended the conference too, so he's got the attendee experience, and Stefan has the looking out of the opposite direction experience. So That's I don't right. know if there's something big that stuck out to you all from the conference. Maybe I'll start with you, Stefan. Yeah, you know, I think it was it was it was very interesting. So I mean, this the the Data X uh, San Francisco conference, and in particular, I was chairing the machine learning track. You know, a conference like that, you're talking about several hundred practitioners, a lot of data scientists, a lot of data engineers, uh, coming together to talk about the latest. Um, and I know Nate got to see some of the other tracks, but uh, you know, in particular, the machine learning track. I think a lot of people came to sort of hear what's new, what's the latest in machine learning, and how can they use machine learning, and uh, and what does it take to use machine learning. And a lot of the presenters themselves were also technical. One of the things that really surprised me though about the presentations was how no matter how deep they got into the details looking at different algorithms uh, even you know specifically thinking about the formulas all of it came back to you have to understand your problem and you have to understand how you're going to use the results of machine learning even as the pieces change that sort of central strategic foundation uh, is unavoidable and uh, and i think a, a lot of them uh, you know when they see their companies or they see people in the field failing uh, with machine learning it has little to do with the technology and it has a lot to do with misalignment with the problem um, i i you know given how often we encounter that with our clients. It was really nice to see uh, that no matter how small or how big, um, everyone sort of comes back to that same issue. Yeah, in, in terms of scope size there, right? So we're, we focus mostly in the mission-driven sector. You know, we have some of these, some bigger nonprofits, but I mean, some of the folks you were speaking with were Uber, That's Facebook, right. LinkedIn. So these are massive organizations, right? Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting to see that scale to your point, right? From small to large, you got to focus in on the alignment of the goals. That I think is one of the reasons why um, you know why this this conference was really valuable, and I I got a lot out of it that I think our smaller clients can use because the challenges are so human, and it's you know big or small, it's always humans that you're working with, and so figuring out how you can empower your staff with these capabilities. Um, you know, machine learning isn't a replacement for the work that you need to do, it's a way to enhance that work. And so, uh, so I think, yeah, I, I think it was, it was really, it was really nice to see um, how uh, big organizations face a lot of the same problems, um, and then hear how they address those. How about you, Nate? What were your what kind of takeaways do you have from your time at Data X? Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things that really struck me that was really interesting was this, this sort of concept of fairness and breadth of discovery. 
You know, I think in a lot of the, you know, AI machine learning space, there's this kind of intrinsic assumption, at least one that I had, where the tool kind of figures out the very best thing for you and gives you this one best example, right? And it saves you all this time or energy because you're just presented with the perfect answer, right? Or the best thing for you. But what, you know, I was, what we found or what I heard in a lot of the presentations was how, you know, getting the breadth of experience and finding the sort of uh, right area to expose with these algorithms was something that all these companies were struggling with. So like for an example, there was the, the dating app Hinge had a presentation there and they were saying that, you know, when they first started working with machine learning, their algorithm identified the sort of um, prototypically most attractive people in any particular geography and they could get initial engagement with their application by just showing you know the most pretty people to the first people who signed up for the app but that actually wasn't servicing their business very well or the users because people weren't actually seeing the whole breadth of their user base people weren't really connecting with each other and the people who were being shown the most were being overwhelmed and not really having a good experience either and so they had this kind of initial min-maxing problem where they maximized initial engagement with the app, but it wasn't really working. And they had to go back and figure out with their machine learning algorithms and their AI suggesting algorithms how to not just show people, you know, the very, very tip of the top, but find the right breadth of people to show in each geography and how to make sure everyone in their user base actually got a fair shake and got to be sort of exposed to each other so that they could make those connections and build a sort of deeper and more full sustainment. And that was really interesting. Uber, on another similar case, uh, showed off their process for helping um, Uber drivers select the best response to Uber riders when they're contacted. So when you write an Uber driver, what happens is the, that a machine learning algorithm analyzes your text message and tries to figure out the intention of it. And then it suggests what it thinks is the best um, reply for that intention to the Uber driver, and they can just send that. But if you don't have the right one, you can kind of back out of it a little and see what it thinks are the near neighbors or the best closest other things to that kind of intent that you might want to say. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, they started out just wanting to make it like, oh, if they say X, reply Y, but then they realized, well, maybe there's more nuance needed or the ability to kind of like shade it a little to the left or right. And I thought that that was, you know, pretty eye opening. And I think a lot of that gets back, you know, sort of again at, at that principle, you know, machine learning algorithms are very good at finding answers to questions, but they're not particularly good at figuring out what question you should ask. And so I think, you know, uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, I mean, one, one of the um, one of the presenters that I think are especially relevant to a lot of the organizations we work with was Bloomberg, um, mm -hmm. sort of a, a big publishing outfit. Um, and, uh, you know, they use machine learning for a lot of the same things that our clients would, figuring out what tags uh, they should have, figuring out how to use those tags, figuring out how to personalize and recommend content to their users. Um, and one of the things they ran into was problems with overfitting. Um, and, uh, and so I think a lot of times they would overfit the solution to their, their clients. And one example of that is um, if they tried to recommend content based on um, popular topics, uh, they quickly started to find that they were recommending popular topics and those topics were popular because they had recommended it. And so being able to sort of understand what you're asking your algorithm to do and understand what inputs are appropriate for that algorithm, because the machine learning algorithm is just going to run with it. It's not going to ask you whether or not, um, you know, you're, it's doing what you meant for it to do. Uh, so I think, I think that sensitivity is important. And, you know, because there are so many ways, and I mean, one of the things we'll talk about is, uh, you know, how many different types of machine learning are out there now and different ways you can implement. So Bloomberg has actually developed a recommender system for their recommender systems. Um, so how can you use machine learning to decide which machine learning approach to use for a given person? Um, so, you know, I think we're really seeing some, uh, a lot of growth in the field, uh, a lot of growth in what's possible. And uh, yeah, yeah, nice to see how, how uh, different organizations navigated that. So yeah, I'm wondering how we, we take this down a level too, right? So this is, these are groups that have already gone there, experimented, had had findings of their own, pulled them back in, right? Like the dating app, um, which also reminds me what you just said on Bloomberg, right? It's like, if I keep showing this thing, well, then of course the popular thing stays the most popular thing because it's the only thing you're seeing. You know, I remember it might've been like 10 years ago when it was first like, and we can have related content <laughs> and we could do a trending piece of content on our website. And it's like, well, then how do we determine which piece should show at the top? And if we show that piece at the top, well, of course that's the popular piece, but that doesn't actually help the audience, right? Get down to like, I think you always talk about it, Nate, like what, what's relevant might not be the most vibrant piece of content you have, not the, 
not the thing that happened today, the thing that happened 10 years ago, but that'll never be there, right? Is that, is that something machine learning can help with? Is like, and where would we even start with? So one of the areas I see people tackling that kind of problem in particular are in these kind of guided discussion experiences online that are assisted by machine learning. And so like a, a one that, that's pretty been in the popular news a lot is called Do Not Pay, which is a thing that will help you contest your parking tickets or you know your other kinds of non-moving violations. And in essence, what somebody did was they said, well, the conversations that you have with like a, a traffic lawyer or someone else who's going to help you get out of that ticket are pretty, you know, well just understood, right? They'll, they'll pick different routes and they'll take different approaches depending on your answers and what the situation is. But there's kind of a guided discussion format for figuring out like how to address your problem. And this guy basically made a, you know, online machine learning system where you go through a wizard that kind of walks you through the interview about what's the deal with your parking ticket. And then it, then it suggests a way, and in some cases actually automatically adjudicates that on your behalf. It'll actually fill out the forms and go and do stuff to try and prevent you from having to pay that parking ticket. And all of that is based on this idea that there's a, a human experience that's being translated into the machine world. And the human experience helps figure out some of that intent. And I think that's where I see the biggest benefit for a lot of nonprofits that have an approach or have direct service methodologies or things like that, which is that, you know, AI is really good, as, you know, Stefan was saying, of figuring out the answers to questions once they're poised. And, you know, if you can develop a script or a system that says, well, here's the kind of interview we want to get, but then we need something that can quickly sift through the answers to that and suggest something that's really relevant, that's a really good place for AI. And similarly with search, I mean, I think that's another place, you know, AI is really good or machine learning is really good at classifying all of your content, but you know, then it needs a little help to help you find the right thing. And I think that's where chatbots are really interesting, where the chatbot can kind of ask you questions that actually uncover your intent. And then it can use that content to find the best filtered content to suggest to you once it has a little bit more of your intent in place and you know in our search uh, you know sort of customization and enablement service for our clients that's one of the first things we do is help them understand that you know Google's kind of taught everybody a bad way of searching which is that there's just this bar and you type whatever into it and then it does its best where you know the reality is for most people with structured content or more in knowledge about the content they're indexing you have a lot of intent you could figure out and filter on and use that to kind of provide really great results and I think we're seeing the marriage of like really powerful search and smart machine learning slash AI to kind of connect those two and get the filters set down even better and also to find the content and describe it without you having to do that manually um, you know there's tons of stuff using natural language processing right now which help figure out what the not just the words in a, a document are, but the intents, the sort of pseudo meanings, the kind of meta knowledge that's in those documents. And you know, with tools like TensorFlow and other things, you're seeing machine learning applications being built that really you know, help people marry up intent that you've discovered through like a chatbot or whatnot with indexed content that you could present to them. So it's that, you're talking kind of quick, that it's TensorFlow? Yeah, so TensorFlow is just one of a variety of sort of machine learning um, uh, libraries, basically, that have been created. There's a variety of them out there that help you take um, things like, you know, uh, tags on content or parts of language within a natural uh, language processing um, sentence, like, you know, word or sentence that somebody says, and actually tie that into models that say, if we think the intent is that they are looking for the nearest clinic, do X. And so that's kind of where the rules-based engines come in, is using things like TensorFlow that connect to things that have figured out some of the information from the user. And that's probably a little worth talking about. One of the things I kept hearing over again is there's this kind of workflow that these organizations are building, where the first one is kind of, you know, understanding and breaking down what somebody's asked the machine learning or AI algorithm to do. Like, what's your request? Like, in essence, let me figure out what you mean by your request. Then there's a second piece of it, which behind the scenes has kind of bucketed and libraried and indexed all of the different things you have that could be answers to some of those requests or some of those intents. And then the middle piece, the mapping piece, are things like TensorFlow that kind of help figure out like, okay, the user has this intent and I have this amount of responses. What's the best one? And should I give them an exact response or a couple of options or say you need to help me refine down because there's still too many and I couldn't figure it out. And so there's a kind of the three pieces, right? There's this like well-organized index of answers this informational system that helps figure out the intent of the request. And then there's a matching algorithm in the middle that kind of says, here's the very best thing for this situation. 
you know, and, and there's a bunch of different ways to solve that. I think that's exactly right. And Nate, you settled on precisely the right word for a lot of the organizations we work with, which is intent. And I think intent is particularly hard for a lot of our clients. Um, you know, some of these big uh, companies that were at the conference have it easy because they know exactly what their users are there to do. You know, you think about Uber, they have, you know, essentially two products and it's get people to take rides and get people to get food delivered. They have that laser focus on, on what they're providing for their audiences. But a lot of our clients, especially, you know, you think about think tank clients um, where each of these organizations can have dozens of centers um, and each of those centers can specialize in dozens of topics and so you have these hundreds of different combinations of things that they can provide to their audiences in different structures and formats for, for each of those. Um, so understanding of all the things you can do for your constituents, which of those that particular constituent uh, intends to do uh, is, is really hard and I think that's where machine learning can make a big difference for, for nonprofits. Yeah, just to tie in that a little bit, um, you know, one of the other interesting use cases that we're starting to see is the ability for AI to create product variations or content variations based on the person's intent. So like the most simple one of these are like summaries of YouTube videos or summary of so podcasts where the AI tries to figure out what the podcast or YouTube video is about and provide a kind of synopsis to people up front. And, you know, one of the things that came up with is the idea of proxy metrics. Um, you know, if something like um, mission impact uh, is, you know, hard to measure and hard to connect back to individual experiences online. Uh, what's something that you can measure? What's a digital footprint of mission impact, maybe even before it occurs? Um, so rather than uh, somebody found their way to a homeless shelter, maybe it's somebody filled out the form to apply for, uh, you know, uh, you know, something. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think it's really, uh, really important that that we figure out what are those things that we want to optimize for so that the machine learning algorithm doesn't run away and just sell everybody's shoes regardless uh, of what you're trying to do. So it's almost like the analytics are a gatekeeper on top of the algorithm. Like, is this uh, the piece that I really want? Nate, oh, we might have a, we have a frozen Nate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have I returned yet? Oh, <laughs> yes, you are back. You are, you are back. Okay. Um, yeah, just to tie on that a little bit, I mean, one of the other things that I think is, is interesting and related to that is this idea of using, you know, uh, you know, machine learning and AI technologies to help kind of figure out what's happening in a landscape or community or an area that a nonprofit or mission driven organization wants to work in or is working in. You know, I think, you know, there's, I forget the name of it, but I saw that there's one organization that's working on pulling in all of the public sector data and analyzing it to let nonprofits ask questions of that data and kind of say things like, you know, what's the access to healthcare in this community or what's the at-risk factor? And there's another one that I saw that is developing a um, likelihood of dropout for high schools and middle schools for students to help them identify the students who need the most support uh, algorithmically, you know, and things like that to kind of help cut down on the amount of in in person triage they would need to know which students are at risk and whatnot um, you know so I think that's another interesting area that's kind of tied into the analytics right which is like you know there's an idea of like how much impact you're having or how much engagement with your attempts to change are happening and then there's also what can we tell about the world that used to be too you know prohibitively staff time intensive or person intensive to figure out that AI and ML can help you figure out and I think that's a pretty interesting and untapped area you know this idea of what sensing tools are out there because of all this public information or all this you know aggregated information that this stuff could help you develop signal out of oh yeah on that student one though I mean how personal is that is that are we getting into PII territory with that is that you know what I mean is it actually there's got to be rules around PII especially for students are you saying that like this thing can help me find out that Nate Parsons needs my help in San Francisco or it's just like no no this area of the mission in San Francisco has oh, no, students in this it's very personalized and it definitely gets into PII areas really quickly I mean that's one of the real challenges I think for you know this world going forward right which is that each person's use case is relatively unique and especially when you get into things that are personal like healthcare, medical care, education, job applications, anything like that, right? Like it has to be unique to you to be really viable in a lot of ways. But of course, as soon as you do that, you're creating a really risky area, you know, and we see that already with things like Facebook where they have that information and they made it available to advertisers to buy and use against. And so people were able to target their messages against nearly, you know, very small groups, maybe not at an individual level, but pretty close to it in terms of that kind of 
PII, and it was like lightly anonymized. But I mean, you know, you can see a world where, you know, if somebody hacked into the school database in the future, they could learn an astronomical amount more than they can today, you know. Okay, we're getting on like, there's like 10 <laughs> more conversations we could start erupting from all these different threads here. Uh, I'm trying to see if I could bring it back into a, a single conversation. I mean, um, yeah, the PII thing just gets me there too. It's, I mean, we're, you know, there's two threads in my head right now. One is getting your organization prep because if technology goes away, it always goes, right? Machine learning and AI, it's here. It's only going to get faster. It's going to get quicker and it's going to be here before you know it. Like how worried should people be now? And, you know, what are the pros and cons benefits for internal staff too? You know, we, we always talk a lot about an audience coming and being able to complete a task faster or have these tools that can sift for intentionality and get me to the right page. But does that also help staff burden on the other side? You know, if, yeah, I don't know if you guys want to riff on that a little bit. Yeah, I'll just throw something out there, which is like one of the altruistic or best, best things about, you know, AI in particular is its ability to help you change behavior and to do coaching and do things like smart reminders and kind of help people change the way that they behave. And, you know, that can be used for good or ill, but generally within organizations, I think it can be really good, right? Like, I think a lot of organizations struggle with staff time and overcommitment and, like, trying to focus on too many things. And something that can help instantiate good cultural habits and help coach people and improve the way the organization works through that, that is really valuable. And, you know, that can happen in really small scale things like, hey, make sure you send this thing to this volunteer as a thank you to really large scale things, you know, which are like, hey, you know, the organization last month spent this much time on outreach and this much time on, you know, vendor management, and that's actually out of whack, and that's going to cause a problem, you know, like, those kind of things are both very possible in the near term. So, yeah, and the thing I would say uh, to that, Tony, is I think machine learning can change what people within these organizations spend their time on. Um, I think it can it can help change, and it can also help um, people in organizations make their decisions with more confidence. Uh, I mean, you know, how many of our clients have somebody whose job it is to decide what goes on the homepage, um, and uh, you know, they like to control that that experience. I think that's very good, and I think we're going to continue seeing that for a long time, uh, unless you know we can really show that machine learning does a perfect job of it, you know, up to the standards of the editorial team. But how many other landing pages are there throughout any website um, that aren't being as curated quite as carefully? Uh, and I think machine learning lets you take that judgment, take that uh, you know, uh, you know, good taste uh, when it comes to curating those experiences and apply that to your entire site all at once. And, and then your editorial staff start to spend more of their time thinking about what is the experience we wanna create rather than going through all the clicks on the website, trying to configure it one page at a time. Um, so it just sort of, it takes, it takes the best of, of what we do and it takes our best ideas and it helps us amplify those. Uh, I, think, I think that's the potential. Um, so not, not a lot to fear other than making our jobs more interesting uh, and scaling our impact. Yeah, and I wonder, it's less about the fear and more about, are we talking, this is a transformation that I can work into or is this like, oh crap. I got to stop the way I'm doing everything now because in two years, this thing's going to happen. And like, I don't have anything correctly put together. And just from our experiences, we know this, right? Like mission-driven sector, big budgets come for that once every three year web build, yeah. right? Which becomes the impetus for the change of everything. And then yeah. by the time they're done, technology is already so far past. I mean, we've seen this with marketing automation. Like right. no, nobody's still really doing it, but geez, it's super affordable and it's been there. No, that's a really, a really good point. And actually that gets at another one of my big takeaways from the conference, which was the importance of modular systems. All of these companies have moved themselves towards a more modular setup where each piece can stand alone on itself. And it has, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, Nate, Nate describes uh, very well, uh, the data contract. Uh, between each of these systems so that when a new piece comes out you can swap the the benefits of a new system in cleanly simply without having to redesign the whole website um, and uh, you know I, I think we already have that thinking and a lot of organizations already have that thinking sort of between you know the website and the email marketing those can be separate you can have a separate donation system um, but increasingly we're starting to see that within platforms um, and uh, and you know 
systems, CMS is like WordPress are already well built for that. Uh, you can have plugins. And so you can build a custom plugin uh, to help manage just one component. Um, and really leaning into that, trying to use those capabilities um, in order to, to manage how your whole organization works is so much better than just hard coding everything in um, or, or trying to build one system to rule them all. Um, and you know, I think that sort of future, future proof, nothing can future proof you better than modularizing your setup. Um, even within the, the machine learning workflows that these organizations have, they're talking about uh, modularizing within that. So if you have a process and you have a particular algorithm um, that's done an okay job at uh, you know, personalizing a feature on a website, for example, you can, in the background, test 10 others and continue testing them and see if you can keep tuning them. And as soon as you have a winner, you just swap it in. Um, and even you know, from a sort of technical perspective, um, there's a lot of work on, on making that uh, platform and language as agnostic. Um, so if your whole uh, you know, technology stack is written in Python uh, for some reason, uh, uh, you can uh, swap in a piece that runs in Java or you can swap in a piece that runs in C. And so making it so that you can leverage all of those different uh, strengths uh, uh, and compensate for the weaknesses of whatever system you have. Yeah, I mean, I do think there's a, there's another, you know, we see this across the, uh, you know, the industry, but there's a sort of consolidation movement that seems to be picking up steam within the nonprofit space. And I do think, you know, organizations that, you know, start investing and in figuring out how to do these things now have a much better chance of being the sort of winners in that consolidation space. Because you, you do see that once people build a good self-service tool or some other way for the AI or ML systems to help people online, those become very popular and instantly kind of elevate those organizations towards the top of the pack, you know. Um, you know, there's one that uh, helps, you know, people who have been victims of like police profiling and things like that, you know, report that online and it's become the de facto standard for that simply because they made it for one city, you know, and I think that shows the power of these things. And so it's not necessarily if you don't do it, you won't be able to, to, to succeed. But I do think that, you know, these are certainly an area where it's going to make a lot of winners and losers because it's going to change the way that people perceive how services are offered, right? Like if before you had to call someone and they'd call you back and they'd contact you and you had to work your way through a process and hopefully their expertise was available then, you know, depending on your time zone or where you're at, or you can go online and have a really curated and, you know, powerful experience anytime, any way that gets, seems to get better each time. I mean, those organizations are going to get more of the share of people who need those services or are trying to find those services. And so, I really do think it's another place where, you know, the people who make an early investment in this are going to be way out in front of the people who don't. So from having to wade through uh, small business affairs with the DC government's website, uh, is there any way we could pitch this to them so they can get this because their website's impossible to find information on even when you're within a certain context, it would be super helpful. I can't imagine they're the only government site that's like that, but uh, let's hope the government adopts this. Do you, and would you be able to pull to get that link to the what you had just mentioned about the police profiling system? Yeah, totally. Um, make yeah. sure to get that in the show notes. Yeah, it's called rahim.org, and I'll make sure to throw it in the show notes. Cool. So I think we need another talk and video, probably really just getting into this democratizing data and how to do it. You know, that it's interesting, right? Like it has to be woven into the DNA of the organization. And I'm just thinking of, well, if I had access, but I didn't really like stuff as program and I wanted money for my program and I can go in and pull my own insights out to make stuff as program that looks so good. You know, we'd like to think that everybody's pulling in the same direction, but you know, I think we have seen, and it's something we like to take head on. It's why people hire us, you know, that there's ego in these things that has to be shaken out and understood. You know, people are working in these fields because they want to get something out of it and they're driven, you know, can work in data drive you to do, can it, can it actually be, you know, because I would think on the other side, could it be an undermining force? If too many people were in there playing with it, like then what's the actual insight that I'm trying to take away? Well, I, th you know, I think, well, first and foremost, I always uh, have, have the highest faith in, in humanity. And so I, I think, <laughs> I think the situations where, where you get uh, a nefarious use of data are going to be fewer, but I think that democratization of data is a defense against that. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to Nate's point before about what are the de defined processes, how do we actually do this? 
Um, I mean, this is something we actually already deliver to a lot of our analytics clients is our, our data catalog, uh, our data inventory, and our data governance documentations. Um, and, and I think within that, if you say a part of the process of reporting and sharing insights means you also have to share your methodology. Um, so actually link us back to the report that you use. So you sort of show your math. Um, and, and I actually think making sure that you have it opened up like that um, so that anyone can go in and double check the numbers and sort of, you know, even not, uh, not to challenge, but just out of curiosity, say, I want to understand how you did that, um, how you came up with that result. Uh, it gives you more opportunities for people to catch one another, not in something, uh, you know, ag aggressive, uh, but even just in very honest mistakes, which are very common in, in analytics. Um, so being able to say, aha, well, you did it this way, but if we do it this way, then we'll actually get a more consistent number or a more global number. Or now we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've made the analysis you did more generalizable um, so that we can apply it to all of our content and not just the one case study that you wrote. Um, so I think, uh, I think it really helps data grow and it keeps people honest and it, and it keeps the insights growing. Yeah, one thing I might just tag on to that is, uh, you know, that question I think Tony is sort of hinting at something else, which is that there is a, a need for grand strategy in every organization, you know, and it's funny how many organizations look at data to help them come up with their strategy versus to manage or run their strategy. And I think that's where the data fudging and the kind of, you know, potential inaccuracies that people want to introduce to data come from, you know, like, if your organization is using something like OKRs or some other system where there are, you know, objectives that are publicly known for both the organization and departments and maybe individuals, and there are, you know, key results like numeric goals that are attached to those that we people say are signs of progress towards the objective, that's a really good way to kind of narrow the argument and the focus about what people are doing with numbers and what they mean and where they go. But, you know, the key there isn't like the OKR process, although that's a nice one. It's It's about the organization having a defined strategy and using data to support that strategy, not hoping they will find their strategy looking in the data. And you know, we find lots of organizations when they first start coming to analytics, they're using what I call vanity metrics, you know, which are things that, that are like downloads or things like that, but don't actually measure or attach to any of their strategic goals or mission. And you know, that's where the road to ruin and data and automation both lie, you know, is you don't want to, you know, look at data or automate anything that isn't focused on a, a mission or a strategic goal. Yeah, I mean, all that seems right to me. And it's why this is such a ripe conversation, because it's, I actually think you, you call it creating a culture of analytics stuff. But I, I think there's a deep culture change and shift that has to happen industry wide and then get understood within the mission-driven space. You know, the for-profit, larger organizations that were speaking at your conference, they actually have the ease of having a bottom line where you have a mission, right? And then you got funding from X different sources and they didn't really tell you what the metric you're supposed to give them back was, so you're trying to figure that out. So I think it gets a, a little harder to, to do that, but then it also takes the shift of, you know, I been in the space for 20 years and it's the same three metrics that have gone to every single board when I worked in-house, right? Or two really, page views and, uh, was it page views and unique visitors? What's that telling anybody? That didn't do anything for the strategy of the organization, but makes everybody feel good. So I, I think there's a challenge to the status quo that has to happen. Like the status quo is gonna do nothing to help these organizations evolve and move forward. You know, and my takeaway from this conversation is, we're talking about machine learning and AI. At least we started that and we got into a whole bunch of different directions as these conversations go. That sounds big and scary to a lot of organizations and how the heck do I get there and I'm trying to just make sure my site's mobile responsive. But it's one of those things where if you're not ready and you don't embrace it and you don't look out, it will just happen. And so, you know, change is either going to happen to you or you could be an active part of it in the transformation. So I almost, that's like this bigger moment, right? I could, you could see what the data could do and then it's how do we train and teach people and get them on board and tell them it's gonna be okay. And some of the roles might need to change in these organizations. But I, I think, you know, we got really big on like a lot of different topics and machine learning, AI, it comes up and we hear it in conversations. You know, one of our big clients, they talked a lot about it, they're all staff and we're working on a, a web build with them. like. Is, is this a setup to get there? I mean, I, I guess if I was an organization listening to this, or where would I start? Like, okay, this sounds cool. I'd like to be in that future. 
Uh, but here I am. What? Where do you begin? What do you do with this? Well, I mean, I'll I'll start on that. I mean, I'll, I'll say to how intimidating machine learning is. Uh, uh, that is changing in a in a big way. Um, you know, machine learning used to be a multi-million dollar proposition for a lot of organizations, um, and I think many things are changing. And a big part the experts at a lot of these for-profit companies have been, as they work, contributing to open source libraries. Uh, so a lot of the capabilities are themselves getting democratized. Um, so if you are a very experienced or even moderately experienced developer, there are libraries that you can go get now and you can, you can play with them, you can use them. Um, and uh, so it makes it a lot easier to incorporate machine learning into um, uh, existing tools, existing platforms. I think in addition to that, there's a new uh, generation of uh, commercial products um, that use machine learning. Either machine learning built into uh, software packages like email marketing systems and, and, and CRMs, um, um, or uh, standalone machine learning platforms that can be, you know, we were talking about modularization before, you can just have your site uh, and you can push your data out to this third-party platform that applies the machine learning to it and then it sends you back the results and helps you uh, run your personalization engine. So I think there are lots of ways that you can start incorporating machine learning that are, you know, now five-figure instead of six or seven-figure um, uh, problems, and, and may maybe even cheaper in, in some select cases. I do think focusing on that modularization piece is, is often going to be best for uh, nonprofit organizations, because nonprofit problems are pretty unique, um, and uh, a lot of nonprofits have their own, you know, particular pipeline, their own particular structure of their content, um, and so you need to have control over the data you put in to a uh, machine learning process. You know, garbage in, garbage out is a, is a famous saying in there. So you need to make sure you're putting in good data if you're gonna get out good insights. Um, is, that, so, is that guy go? Is exactly guy go? right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, and then also for the, the investment in machine learning to be worthwhile, um, uh, I think it's important to figure out where your work can have the most impact. Um, so I would say your tools uh, and you know the parts of your ecosystem that either have a lot of use uh, are getting a lot of traffic, and so the website's going to be a logical place to start, or uh, uh, the part of your ecosystem where it can have the most impact. And so I think email marketing uh, is really powerful because there's a lot of impact that goes through uh, people's email systems, um, or on the on the program side. I'm figuring out how you can use machine learning to actually conduct the research, actually design your services. Um, so I, I think those would be the places where I would want to start. Yeah, and you know, I have a slightly different angle on it, which is like, uh, you know, to even get prepared to do those those things. I think one of the things organizations can do, and they're lucky in this respect, is is kind of double down on existing best practices for things like content strategy. You know, one of the most important things for any organization that wants to use ML or AI or anything like that is to have content or pieces of data that the system can interpret and look at. And, you know, what that really means from a, you know, organization standpoint is making sure that you figure out what fields you want attached to your content, like, oh, instead of putting the author in the body field of a blog post, put the author in an author field so that you can easily identify that that's the author of a blog post. You know, there's simple things like that that make the machine learning hill a lot shallower. And, you know, the one that we always propose to organizations is to come up with a unified and central taxonomy for the organization, right? So that, you know, article X can match up with video Y, which can, you know, match up with podcast Z, right? Like, it's so common for organizations, especially in different departments, to use variants or similar but not quite the same taxonomies for things or to just have different taxonomies or to have the other problem, which is they don't manage the taxonomy. They let lots and lots of duplicates and aliases and synonyms for the same terms appear, you know, and just solving that problem, which is well within the wherewithal of every organization is a huge step towards being machine ready or machine learning ready or AI ready. And so I totally agree with everything Stephen said, but I would just start even a level lower, which is like, just get your content strategy humming and you'll be way better off than if you didn't do that. Uh, it's, that's a huge point. Uh, and, and the good news is everything you do to prepare yourself for machine learning is just good for your organization regardless. Um, so even if you don't get there, um, you know, having that as your goal is going gonna, is gonna to help you put in some, some best practices that will improve your content overall. So, you know, that's a really good point. All right. So we've, we're going to, we got a meeting with our top prospect 
finally got him into the executive office. And they're like, hey, AI, ML, why do I care? What's this supposed to do for me? Well, you know, the easiest one is, you know, do you want your dollar to buy you 50 cents or a dollar 50 cents worth of goods, you know? And I think that's the difference between AI and ML ha having orgs and not, which is that every dollar spent on that is force multiplied or magnified by the successful use of those tools. And the organizations that use those are going to have a much greater impact per staff hour spent or per dollar spent than the ones that don't. And you know, it really is going to be a winners and losers situation where if you are competing against someone in the thought space or marketing space or services space, or even just trying to have a better impact than the negative impact of other organizations, you need to have this kind of you know, tooling at your disposal to compete and to you know, be competitive. And so I'd say it's all about how far do you want your investment dollar to stretch? So of course I want my investment, Nate, but is what you're telling me I need to do is a $500,000 project today and then I still am not there? Like how many years does this take? What kind of, sounds like there is a starting point. Maybe it's making sure I got taxonomy or questions I can ask, but what does this look like over the course of three years? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. You know, what we always recommend is that you, you know, don't invest a lot early so that you're, you know, you don't have anything to invest later once you've really figured out your problem. There's a lot of learning in the doing and there's a lot of culture change and change management in your organization that you need to adopt in order to be successful with these. It's not just install a system and go. And that's a huge mistake that we see a lot of organizations do where they get a lot of money together and they get something, but they didn't change their culture or their way of doing business and the tool just sits there and they have, you know, Salesforce marketing class or Marketo or Pardot or any of these other tools just sitting around and they're not using it effectively. And the reason is somebody convinced them they should get the capability without the culture change. <coughs> so I'd say no, don't spend half a million first. Spend, you know, 50K or whatever your budget will support getting some of these things working, showing how people need to change their workflows and their processes, figuring out how the organization really needs to adapt itself in order to use these tools and keep making incremental investments that keep improving that. I mean, I can see you're obviously choked up about these organizations that, uh, you know, don't use those tools the way they should. Uh, I mean, we have passion for all of our client projects, and that's why we talk about this. <laughs> Stefan, do you have anything to add there? Uh, I mean, that's, uh, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, I think that being able to start with something focused in mind, um, this is a problem I want to solve. This is a capability I want to add uh, to to my ecosystem. Uh, and then go with that and get it in place and figure out how you can learn from that. Figure out if the approach you use to solve your first problem can be applied to your second, third, eighth, tenth, uh, and so on. And and I think there's a, there's a lot that can be learned each time you go through this process. Uh, and starting small lets you, lets you have a win. Uh, and then lets you figure out how to get the staff aligned around it, help them learn from the process so they can do a better job the next time. Uh, I, you know, like, uh, you know, you've never built your last website um, and, uh, and you'll never have built your last machine learning algorithm. Uh, you know, there's, there's always room for improvement. And, and as situations change, you need to be able to, to, to change it and update it. So I think planning for this as a, a new line of capability um, that you want your staff to be able to understand, to own, to maintain, and to evolve uh, is, is really important. And I think, you know, to, to Nate's other point, uh, you know, why do it? To, to scale your impact. If you want to have more impact, uh, this is a way to do that. Uh, I, I think, you know, quite, quite simply, um, you know, most organizations we talk to um, are not running perfectly. Um, there's, there's always something about uh, the way they manage things, something they can optimize. There's always an opportunity um, for organizations to improve the experience of their constituents um, in one way or another. And I think machine learning can be at the heart of a lot of those solutions. Okay, any final thoughts? Yeah, well, I just think one other thing to think about for organizations is that, you know, the doing changes the organization and that's usually for in a good way, right? And if you successfully adopt machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques, you're probably going to want to do different things with your staff and with what you're doing even in your mission because you'll solve some of the basic problems that are capacity blockers for doing more advanced work. And that's another reason you want to roll into this incrementally, which is that you don't really know what you want to be doing organizationally 
once until you have reached a new plateau, right? Like I think every organization is reaching new maturity, new sophistication in how they're addressing their mission. And one of the things AI and ML lets you do is jump a maturity level by taking a lot of things you already know how to do well and taking them off the plate of your staff to let them learn how to do things they don't do well yet or don't have the time to do well yet. And I think that's another key part of this. Like organizations that adopt this aren't just doing what other organizations are doing faster. They're actually learning new, deeper, more interesting things to do on top of the things other organizations are doing. Like it. Stefan, was that your closing thought before? Did you have one more you wanted to? Uh, I have as many closing thoughts as you need. I uh, yeah, I know. We, we probably went really long. This is our first one. So anyone who's made it this far, if you're listening, you know, maybe we cut this down. Maybe it's a little shorter than the hour we just spent. But needless to say, we could rip for a while. Um, you know, there's show notes below. Leave us a comment uh, here on our blog or if you're seeing this on LinkedIn, leave us a comment there. Like it, share it, tell a friend about it, send them our way. If you got ideas for topics you want to hear folks from our company talk about or you're an outside guest and you want to come in and talk with us, we'd love that too. You know, some of my key takeaways, I think no matter the size of the organization, it all starts with alignment. You know, what is the goal, right? Don't, I like Nate, when you had said, you know, don't let the data tell you what strategy is. You got to have strategy and then use the data to help you get to where you need to go and amplify those tactics. I think Stephan, uh, Lisa said it in our company, but we always like to use it, right? Is that answers get all the credit, but questions do all the work. So what are those questions we can really be pushing towards here? You know, I think some of the other pieces are, it sounds big and scary in the aggregate, but this is happening and it's happening now. And there are steps you could start taking to get there. You know, there, the status quo is not going to jump you to where you need to be. You know, we talk, uh, my other takeaway is we talk a lot about change management. And, you know, we, we as a company backed away from marketing and talking about transformation. And I feel like I'm ready to steer back into it really hard just on this, right? And I, I love what you guys are saying there. It's, it's in the doing of this that that change and transformation starts to happen, right? And it's, and maybe there's another one of these where we get into just agile, but how do you remain and have the agility within your organization to then take a learning and change and do something different and enhance it? So it sounds, you know, machine learning sounds like it could benefit my audience for intentionality, quicker serving them to complete a task to get what they want, which hopefully will make them want to come back and engage even more deeply with me because they're serving my needs in an easy way. It can help me amplify my staff. You know, we get asked this question a lot when we're on transformation projects of like, well, now who do I hire? What do I need to do? Well, it's that's probably not the right question exactly, right? Like, what do you want to be doing? What can the machines do to take care of a lot of that more repetitious task? And let's get you to the next higher level of something that will always remain high touch, human focused. And let's find the right people to do those jobs. I think we've identified at least uh, an insights officer and a chief automation officer as two do potential roles coming out. Uh, so this was exciting. Um, thanks for your time today, gentlemen. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. Well, signing off for our, our first official, we don't have a name for it yet, but I like the concept <laughs> of Parsons TKO. If you all got, if you got ideas, you can leave that for us too. Maybe we'll call it that. <laughs> <laughs> all Very right. Good. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>